my name is Russell Gilchrist. Um, I'm currently design principal at Gensler. Uh, we're a very big design organization. Uh, 5,000 people and 47 locations around the world. Um, I'm really here to talk about, well, my presentation is in two parts. Uh, a little bit at the beginning, we talk about uh, tall buildings and in particular, Gensler's approach to how we talk about tall buildings. Uh, and then there's a little bit about me uh, and some of the previous places that I've worked. And then what I've done for you today is to include three case studies of buildings that uh, uh, Peter and I were uh, involved in in China. Um, with uh, 25, 28 years post-qualification experience, I've been very lucky to work at a number of very, very good design firms, including Foster and Partners, Richard Rogers, SOM, and now currently Gensler. So um, really for the last 10, 12 years, I've been uh, tall buildings, um, some super tall. Uh, the three case studies I have today are not really super tall. The first part of the presentation uh, will kind of address that, but uh, the three case studies we have range between 20 stories and 40 stories, so still reasonably large. So um, let's move on. Where am I pointing? This is not moving. One. Oh, that one. Oh. That's the. Still not moving. Technology. <laughs> nope. One slide. Um, yeah, this is not a very interesting slide. Okay, well, <laughs> while we're waiting for it to restart, um, I'm, oh, let's try again. Okay. So, um, at Gensler, we've uh, obviously been involved in some very, very tall buildings. Uh, most recently, uh, we've had a project that's just opened in Shanghai, Shanghai Tower. Um, it's 600 and 30 meters tall, so it's the second tallest building in the world. Um, but what we've tried to do at Gensler is to try and develop a point of view that makes it, us different from our competitors. So the first part of this uh, presentation is really to try and let you know what we at Gensler, um, how we approach tall building design. Okay. So um, I think probably first of all, the, the, the best way to start really is how do we define tall buildings? Um, some of you may be aware that there's a, a group called the Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, CTBUH. Um, I'm a former member of the advisory board on there. They, they actually set down some criteria that define tall buildings, except there's no minimum height for a tall building. Uh, so, but anything uh, up to 300 meters, we call a tall building. And anything over 300 meters, we call a super tall building. And then anything over 600 meters, and there's very few of those around the world, we call a mega tall building. So that just really um, starts to uh, kind of just classify building heights, really. So that. I think that's an important uh, uh, introduction. So the three case studies that I'm going to be talking about today are really in the tall building category rather than uh, super tall or tall. So there's a, a number of reasons uh, how tall buildings have kind of developed. So obviously, um, in the 19th century, we started, where I work actually in Chicago, we, they developed a notion of building tall. 
those, those buildings were predominantly masonry, so they were either built of brick or they were built of stone. And it's only recently, as the 20th century has progressed, uh, when we start looking at uh, Empire State Building, which was still a masonry building, uh, that we moved on to uh, the middle diagram, which is the uh, Burj Khalifa, which I worked on when I was at SOM. Um, and then there's the Shanghai Tower. And then, you know, what is tomorrow? What's going to be stopping us? Or what are going to be some of the restrictions in terms of building taller than the tallest building in the world at the moment, which is Burj Khalifa? Now, there's another, other factors in tall buildings, and it's really what we call market trends. So... Um, the evolution of the tall building has really um, developed um, over the last hundred years. But what's interesting for, I'm not so sure about Russia, but what's certainly interesting for us uh, in the US and Europe is that um, there's actually been a return of people migrating back to the cities that would previously uh, have moved out to the suburbs for all sorts of reasons. So, um, especially the demographic now with younger people, um, there's a blurring between what they do at work and what they do in their leisure time. So people want to live and work in the same kind of place, location. Uh, uh, you know, that's a kind of definitely a kind of a, a new trend for us. And uh, we're seeing buildings in Chicago that have been empty uh, for several years that were office building now being converted into residential buildings. Um, now, obviously, one of the big, big drivers in terms of if you should decide to build a tall building is really economics, uh, you know. Uh, and actually, uh, in very few cases, building really, really tall uh, doesn't always make a lot of economic sense. So there's usually other factors behind that, and that could be all sorts of things. The Shanghai Tower, for instance, um, I don't think would have been built with... Um, a typical developer because, you know, it's a, an expensive building. It takes seven years to build, if you're lucky, without any problems. And the financial viability of that, whether you have your own money or you're borrowing money to pay for a, a project for that long, is incredibly onerous. So, um, and in fact, the Shanghai Tower was actually developed for the Shanghai government. It wasn't for a, a private developer. And they had a larger motive, which was really trying to reinforce uh, the international reputation of Shanghai as a city. So it was really the idea of building an icon that could be part of postcards and a kind of wider branding, if you like, of Shanghai. But what we're finding is that there's a number of models that usually drive tall buildings, uh, obviously one of which is market demand. So that goes without saying although the super tours and mega tours tend not to be market driven. Um, there's prestige, which arguably Burj Khalifa and Shanghai Tower fall into that category. Um, and now a new trend and actually a trend in existing tall buildings is the idea of the observatory experience. So this is really an idea of how you can kind of capitalize or monetize a tall building for a public experience which generates revenue, which is obviously goes some way to offset the cost of, of building very, very tall. And then there's something that we call the, the Burge effect. Um, you know, Dubai is obviously a very, very uh, new emerging city in the sense of being a central business district. So when the Burj Khalifa was conceived and even built, it was really a very, very tall building in an isolated part of Dubai, an expanding part of Dubai. And uh, actually, you could argue that Shanghai Tower was really part of a longer-term vision of the same idea, whereby you build a tall building that acts as a catalyst, so the tall building in itself doesn't necessarily gener generate or make financial sense, but in the longer term, and particularly with groups like EMAR in Dubai, they were really not looking at the short term of building a tall building. They were looking at the longer term, 20, 30 year effect of how buildings and development would arise as a consequence of building something very, very tall. So the next slide is really lifestyle revolution. Um, 
I mentioned earlier that people are starting to return to the cities to live and work rather than work there, leave the city in the evening and go home to the suburbs or wherever. Um, actually, the, the workplace is changing. Uh, for us in the US, um, the technology boom has really changed the way um, people are actually working. So there's a kind of internal revolution in the way that we live and work. Um, this is also true in China. I've spent the last, well, I've been back in Chicago for a year and a half, but I spent, lived and worked in China for two and a half years. And a lot of the uh, tech companies like Alibaba and others are, uh, 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 are actually also, um, they're, they're actually developing the same kind of workplace kind of um, methods as, as uh, California and Silicon Valley in particular. Um, the idea of the third one is really this idea of uh, the public being able to enjoy a tall building. Um, we recently carried out a study on uh, a project in Chicago, uh, which was the old Spire site, Calatrava site, which was a condo building that never got built because post-2008 there just wasn't a demand for, for doing it. But one of our um, recommendations to a potential developer was to open up an observation deck at the top because we reckoned, and there was good statistics to back it up, um, that actually simply opening an observation deck at the top of a building could generate somewhere between 110 and 130 million US dollars a year. So, you know, you only have to multiply that by 10 or 12, and then you've basically paid for a 600-meter uh, building in, 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 in probably 10 to 12 years. So that's over and above renting out the rest of the building. So that's, that's a very big um, factor in terms of any decision to build tall. Now the reality is they were residential developers and they decided to build three smaller buildings rather than one taller building. But actually it was a, a real factor in their decision making to, to build a, a very tall building because they liked the idea of having $120 million every year. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, this is, this is just part of a much uh, larger document that we send out to potential clients. Um, I'm not sure who I'm addressing here, whether I've got mostly engineers or any architects. It'd be nice to think there's a few clients out there because we would like to build a tall building in Russia. So, um, But, um, you know, work is coming back to the CBD. So um, this is a very large factor in something like the Shanghai Tower, which is two-thirds office space. Um, another critical element in terms of living in these tall buildings is how do we humanize them and create spaces that people can live and work and play in during the, the working day. So we um, create a lot of public spaces. The, the Shanghai Tower has um, nine what we call kind of uh, public areas within. So there's a, uh, an occupied public program at the lower level of the atrium and all those other floors can also enjoy those amenities uh, all the way up the building, whether that be an office building or um, a hotel or whatever. Observation I've touched upon. But the other big idea of um, tall buildings nowadays is that, you know, 20, 25 years ago, the tallest building in the world would probably have been in Chicago or New York. Um, and it probably would have been an office building. And it probably would have been a steel building. Uh, nowadays, any tall building, it almost doesn't matter where it is will probably be a mixed use. So there'll be multiple programs. There'll be an office, a hotel, residential, retail, entertainment. So we very, very rarely have any projects that are a single program. It's always, always, always mixed use. So all of these factors combined have actually started to develop a slightly different approach for us for, for tall and super tall buildings. Uh, another factor which plays directly into Swagon and um, the sponsors here today is really high performance building. Um, wherever I've worked, um, I've always been inter interested in uh, high performance, low energy buildings. And uh, this is a project that we've uh, just finished. Again, it's a tall building rather than super tall in Pittsburgh, actually, which, which touches a number of the kind of factors that I just touched upon. Whereas Pittsburgh is, um, you know, an old steel town in, um, in uh, yeah, the, the eastern part of uh, the U.S. Uh, the downtown area was um, 
basically deserted. Everybody had migrated out to the suburbs, whether they were living and working. And this is one of their biggest companies, PNC, which is a bank, decided to move their whole headquarters back into Pittsburgh. And uh, they've occupied this building uh, that you can see here. And actually, it's had the effect of a, a catalyst of regenerating high and low-rise buildings in the downtown area of Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> this is a project that uh, uh, we did for, I'm going to contradict myself now, this is actually for a, a company in Seoul that were going to move all their employees back into one tall building. So it was predominantly an office building. This is really the exception for us rather than the rule for all the reasons I've just outlined. This is, a, this is a mega tall building. This was 640 meter tall building. Um, single use, um, but actually um, a kind of refinement of some of the ideas that we developed on the Shanghai Tower with uh, genuine kind of, uh, well, we call them vertical kind of cities or neighborhoods, whereby we create a series of atriums uh, around uh, a series of floor plates to, um, to act as additional program amenities for, for the workers in the building. There was going to be 18,000 people in this one tall building. So uh, this was a competition which unfortunately we found out uh, a few months ago that we didn't win. But competitions like this is a really good way for us as architects to explore different ideas, whether it's working with people like Peter in terms of building systems or whether it's just exploring other ideas architecturally that might be interesting or develop the, 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 the approach of designing super tools. Shanghai Tower, which uh, probably most of you kind of know or have heard about, that's uh, just starting to be occupied now. Uh, building in China is a, is a real, real challenge, but uh, this is a building that we're very, very proud of. And, you know, because Gensler really, up until 10, 15 years ago, was really considered a interior design firm. We weren't really known for our architecture. So it's only in the last 10 or 12 years that we've developed a reputation for building, uh, for building buildings, let alone super tall buildings. So this represents for us you know, a big marker now because whenever there's a competition or a RFP for a super tall building, we're usually one of six to 10 architects around the world that get invited to design them. Um, Actually, this is the project I talked about, the, the case study in, uh, in Chicago that was actually uh, repurposing the, uh, the Calatrava site, which was a condo site. It's right on Lake Michigan. So the idea of an observation deck at the very top, top of a building is very compelling because um, it would easily be the tallest building in Chicago, um, uh, probably the third tallest in the world and it would just have a 360 view of the whole of Chicago, including Lake Michigan. So um, that's actually currently uh, a competition uh, that we've actually decided not to participate in, uh, simply because the, 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 the proposal is actually asking for three, tall, uh, three smaller buildings rather than one super tall. <coughs> and it's not a very big, <coughs> excuse me, it's not a very big site. So, um, we don't believe that that solution works, so we pulled out of the competition because we genuinely believe that um, this site could really take a super tall building. Um, we're still building in the Middle East. Uh, these are two projects of ours, side by side. Um, these are relatively small uh, buildings uh, in terms of uh, floor plate size. Um, and this was really to... Um, the brief from the client, these are actually, these are office buildings, but these are not super tall, um, was really to have a flexible floor plate. So uh, this is just by way of um, example of how things develop. So um, another thing that Gensler brings to the table, and one of the reasons that we've been so successful is that, uh, and a lot of our clients tell us this, is that the reason they choose Gensler for designing their buildings is we have a number of practice areas ranging from uh, uh, aviation through sport, through brand design, through financial services. We've made our name as an interior design company. We understand how the workplace works and we understand how residential works and we understand how mixed use works. So tall buildings usually 
allows us to, we have 31 different practice areas, and tall buildings really overlaps at least 19 of these practice areas. So we're able to bring this other expertise over and above designing super tall buildings uh, for our clients. So we found that that's actually a very, very major factor of why they might choose us rather than some of our competitors. Um, another thing is that uh, we work on a global kind of scale. So, you know, we're, we're working mostly in North America, but we're working in Europe, we're working in uh, uh, not building super tours, but other parts of uh, Russia and uh, Middle East, uh, India and China are our major markets. And we do a lot of research as well. We um, have an annual uh, research grant. Uh, we have 130 applications for this current year, which will give 30 grants, and each between 10 and $20,000. So we try and make the research feed into our project work. So we find that that's an effective way of actually developing research programs. So, and these are just some of the uh, graphics here that actually explain uh, the tall, taller, tallest refers to the up to 300, the up to 600 meters, and the taller than 600 meters. So these are projects that we have underway. We've got uh, 40 or 45 tall buildings that we've been doing in the last eight to 10 years. <coughs> um, and this is a project that we're currently doing in Suzhou, which is just north of Shanghai, northwest. Uh, this will be even taller than Shanghai Tower. This is a 720 meter high mixed use project in Suzhou. And this is the project that I've been directly uh, working on. It's a, a lead platinum. You'll all be familiar with lead, I'm sure. Uh, so this is a lead platinum building in Shanghai. Uh, this is only 250 meters tall, so it only qualifies as being tall rather than super tall. Um, but this is a very high performance building. Uh, very, very high air quality, internal air quality. We'll touch upon this a bit later in my presentation, and I'm sure it will be a major part of Peter's presentation. But air quality, particularly in somewhere in China, is a, is a big deal because uh, the pollution is really bad. Shanghai is a little better than Beijing, but... Uh, Air quality is now a major issue, particularly for tenants and particularly for international tenants that are taking space in Shanghai. So uh, this is actually quite an expensive building. It's sort of $500 a square foot. Um, and, and a lot of that money has been put into the kind of building systems to ensure that have optimum air quality. Buildings in China are very rarely very well put together. Uh, they're very poorly maintained by and large. This is actually uh, an American developer called Heinz, and it's Middle Eastern money from Abu Dhabi. They will hold on to this asset that, again, is unusual in China. People tend to develop and then sell their buildings, where this is a long-term investment. So they're prepared to put the extra value into all the building systems, particularly the air systems, and hold on to it for 30, 40 years because they see that as a longer-term investment. And the other factor in this is they're hoping to increase the average rental value in downtown Shanghai as a consequence of higher performance, higher specification. Um, these are just some of the buildings that I've been involved in. Uh, not all of them, actually none of them with Gensler. Uh, the project on the left is something that Peter and I worked on. That's in Guangzhou. Uh, it's called the Pearl River Tower. I did that when I was at SOM. I was a design and technical director at SOM. Um, interestingly, from this audience, this still has the largest uh, radiant ceiling installation anywhere in the world. This is 2 million square feet of radiant chilled ceiling uh, installation. So that was a very important project for me. I learned an awful lot as an architect working with people like Peter in terms of how we uh, develop and integrate building systems into super tall buildings. Uh, the next one along is actually also in Shanghai, another SOM building. Uh, that's an office and hotel. Um, the next one was actually the SOM submission for the um, project in Jeddah, which actually Smith Gill won. Uh, so that was the SOM entry into the Kilometer High Kingdom Tower. Uh, the next project is actually a project I did while I was at Richard Rogers uh, in Spain, uh, which never got built. And then 
Lastly is uh, Leadenhall uh, in, in the city of London. Uh, very, very high performance uh, building in, in, in London, actually which I visited two weeks ago because the Richard Rogers Partnership have just moved into the 14th floor. It's a very, very impressive building. It's called the Cheese Grater. So, um, so this sort of brings me on to the reason why I'm talking to you today because I've always been interested in how buildings behave as an architect. I've always, having worked at Foster's and Rogers where um, everything is really exposed, all the building systems, the vertical transportation systems tend to be a part of the makeup or the philosophy of how the building works and how it looks. So um, this is the Pearl River Tower and I put this slide in because I've always been interested in how buildings react to particular environments. So, and how would that building have to change if it was built in, I don't know, uh, Australia or Russia or India or Switzerland or South America. So um, this was a slide from a presentation I gave where uh, the slide on the left is actually where it is in Guangzhou and uh, near Hong Kong in China. Uh, but then what happens if you put it in the Swiss Alps? What happens if you put it into the kind of plains in uh, Africa? What happens if you put it in the you know, hostile uh, cold conditions? Uh, what about what happens to the building if you put it in Peru and Machu Picchu? And what happens if it goes on the planet Mars? How do the building systems and, and uh, enclosure, uh, how, how do they have to respond to those particular environments? So that's always something that I've been really, really interested in. Uh, these are just some of the projects that I've been inv involved in. And what you understand is that when you're working in China, or whether you're working in Italy or whether you're working in South America, is that you have to respond differently. Buildings have to, uh, you know, actually do different things. So, actually, th these are both actually in London, actually, um, and where a lot of the measures that we do, because it has a heating climate and a, a cooling climate, whereas places in China, especially southern China, you're cooling all year round. So that in itself is going to develop a different approach. So now I'm going to come to the kind of three kind of case studies that Peter and I developed together, and he'll probably talk a little bit more about the detail of how the systems work. I have enough of an understanding to be a little bit dangerous, whereas actually Peter knows what he's talking about. So um, I put this slide in because, oh, something happened to the slide, but never mind. Um, as an architect, um, we have to worry about a number of things, obviously, so of which uh, what the building looked like is just one of them. Uh, we, have, we have requirements from a client in terms of what they want to include in a building. Uh, we, have a, we have requirements for code, local code. We have to think about lifetime costs as well as uh, first cost. Uh, we have to think about a number of things. So really, as an architect, and Peter only has to think about one thing. He only has to work out how the systems work. Whereas we have to work out a number of things. So um, that doesn't make us any more clever than Peter. It just means that we're always having to juggle things. You know, so our elevator consultant always wants the most efficient elevatoring system. The trouble is the most efficient one, oh, sorry, he wants the optimal performance. The trouble is they take up space. So I'm always having to balance, you know, whether 16 elevators is uh, going to work rather than 18. So, because for us and for my client, it affects the efficiency of the building. So, we're jungle juggling a number of these issues. So, um, so, a lot of the things that we come up with and the good ideas, we have to test. Because uh, we can come up with some, you know, very kind of um, interesting kind of ideas, but they do have to make sense. We're never going to build them if we can never justify their use. So every time we go through uh, building design, we have a com complete laundry list of what are we trying to do here? Can we make some passive systems work uh, over and above trying to use active systems? So this is something that preoccupies us every single time, and it's usually something we test with Peter about. It could be the performance of the facade in terms of what we're do trying to do to um, stop solar gains, um, and it could be, um, you know, 
It could be control systems. It could be um, discussions around efficiency around if the building is not occupied or only three people are in at the weekend uh, working on their own. We don't want to have a whole floor or several floors of building systems working when only you know, a few people are in the building. So this is always a discussion we have with a client. Why don't we have controls that are occupancy dependent? Now, the problem with that is, from a client perspective, that's an expensive first cost. Um, and if we have an owner-occupier, like some of the tall buildings that I showed in Seoul and Korea, where they were going to occupy the whole building, that would make sense. But if it's a developer that's going to have multiple tenants in there, they don't want to make that decision to put building systems in. So. Um, I'm going to be quite quick here going through these three different buildings. Uh, one's a headquarters building, one is um, a speculative op office building with some retail, and the other is a competition that we did with Peter in Sh Shenzhen, which is southern China. Now, the reason I've chosen these three um, projects, so we've done multiple projects together, but uh, was really more to do with climate. So. Beijing, I don't think is unlike St. Petersburg. It's uh, pretty cold in winter. Um, it does get warm in the summer. There is a heating and cooling season. Shanghai is uh, slightly more uh, temperate. It's kind of humid. Um, it does snow in Shanghai, but it's not really very much at all. And then Shenzhen, which is really uh, you're cooling all year round. And sometimes we're not even putting heating at all in buildings. So. Um, that was just really to give you a broad spectrum of how we think about buildings uh, in different climates. So um, these are some of the charts that Peter gives me at the very beginning of a project. And uh, I never really understand them, but I put them into a presentation. So um, I, I, <laughs> I know enough about them to, um, to be able to start thinking about how is that climate going to affect how I design the building. So. Um, Harbin Bank. Now, this is, uh, this is a project that's currently under construction. So um, we did several, several studies for this, just as an anecdotal thing for my client. And, uh, you know, I think we did 17 different schemes. It was completely ridiculous. But uh, we ended up with this one eventually because, and he chose this one because it's a bank, okay? So my client is a banker. He liked this scheme because he thinks it looks like a bulging wallet. So it looks like it's a wallet that is full of money. So this really appealed to him. But for me, it was quite interesting because it gave us the opportunity to do a double skin building. So this project is really about a single glazed outer layer. Do you have some slides on this, Peter, in your presentation? So um, Peter might explain some of the kind of uh, calculations involved, but the architectural idea was to have uh, an externally single glazed outer skin and then maybe 900 millimeters back we have the double, uh, the, the double glazed skin. So it's an externally ventilated facade system. Um, we quickly dismissed the idea of actually bringing natural air into the building uh, just because the environment in Beijing is too polluted. So it would have the, the environment's too polluted, and uh, traditionally, Chinese don't look after their building. They're not very good at maintenance, so they don't have the right regime. So very soon, the filters would have got clogged up. They would never would have changed them. So something that was designed to be very responsive would actually very quickly become unresponsive and expensive. So uh, Peter and I made a decision not to take the air inside the building, but the, the, the facade to act as a climate moderator. So in summer, obviously, we're trying to negate the solar gain. So we have a completely automated blind system that's uh, uh, responding to a photocell that would be on the roof. So if the sun is shining on the facade, the blinds come down. So we're trying to kind of stop the solar gains coming to the building. In winter, uh, when it does, when we do have sunny days in Beijing, we would be doing the reverse. The blinds would be up and we'd be relying on the on the passive solar gains to actually act as a kind of preheat, if you like, uh, for the building system. So um, again, climate directly impacting how we would uh, design the building. And actually, 
Those two slides on the top right are actually more or less the same view. Uh, it, they're from the Gensler office in Beijing, and that's a building by SOM, uh, the tall building on the left-hand side. It is actually in there somewhere, um, and literally this is 80 meters away. So this is Beijing on a very, very bad day. So you get some idea of what the air quality is like in northeast China. So that's what really we're up against in terms of um, uh, building environment. So just a couple of diagrams just to show you the shape of the building. It's, uh, it's a headquarters building, single occupant. Again, that makes a very big difference for us because they will make that investment because it's their own employees, it's their own building, and they're paying their utility bills every month. So it's an easier argument to have a more high-performance building when your client is uh, working in it every day. So this is just some of the studies that we go through with Peter and others. So you can see that the, the floor plate is actually pretty simple in terms of occupied area. We've got two atriums on the, the northeast and the southwest that act as a kind of tempered space, so that's not conditioned. That is just space that you can use during the summer and the winter. It wouldn't, it, you know, if, if it was in the summer, you might have to take your jacket off because it might be a bit hotter than the occupied space. And if you were going to go in there in the winter, as Chinese do to smoke, um, you might have to put your coat on. So we're not conditioning those areas. They're acting as buffer zones between the outside and the occupied areas. And just some diagrams of how I explained in, in summer. We'd, the blind system would be working to kind of counteract the solar gains, and in winter we'd have the blinds up. And there's just a rendering of the building at night. Now, this is uh, quite an interesting project. I'm going to have to take a drink. In China, this is a speculative building. So our opportunities here for doing something a little bit more progressive were a little bit more limited, but nonetheless... Um, This says Beijing. This should say Shanghai, but uh, never mind. Um, this is actually in Shanghai. But the, the tower, if you like, is it's a 40-story tower. It's a purely speculative office, so we don't know who's moving in. Um, there's a retail development, retail pavilions, and there's a building in between, which is actually uh, for the Chinese government. It's an immigration building that the developer was building for free. Um, in order to get the planning gain and the, the, the floor space on the side. So um, that's just the context of that one. Now, for us, again, I was, I'm going back to this thing, everything that we have to juggle. So for us, the important thing is we had to build the tall building on this part of the site. So a big driver for me was view. What's the view from this building? And what's the orientation of the building in terms of solar response from the sunshine point of view. So a lot of these things, this building is just, Shanghai Tower is just down here, so it's quite close by. We're right on the river, so obviously from a commercial point of view in terms of rental value, the views of the river are optimum. Uh, and so we have to bear that in mind when we're designing our building. And obviously, uh, so views and urban context, as well as the building performance, are all contributing to the overall design of this building. So we did lots of studies in terms of uh, what the facade should do. Should it be slightly inclined? Because we have a lot of exposure on this site. From uh, The north facade is actually the smallest facade. So from 5, 6 o'clock in the morning in the summer to the evening time, over three quarters of the building is going to be exposed to the sun. So we were trying to develop a series of facade responses that could actually deal with the solar gains in a passive way rather than an active way. Um, obviously, depending on sun angle, we may have to have some mechanized systems in there, but we're trying to deal with a lot of it in a passive way rather than an active way. So again, lots of analysis in terms of views, approaches, as well as thinking about how building systems might work. And the interesting thing about this from just a kind of building system and architectural point of view is that we actually developed a core that was offset. So this is not a central core, this is an offset core because the views for us are all the way around. So what that means is that 
on 100% of the floor plate occupied area, everybody's got a view of the river, which was considered important from a client perspective. Whereas if we put the core in the middle, the people on this side of the core would not be able to enjoy any of the views. So another thing that we become obsessed about is the floor to ceiling height. So the integration of the building systems within an overall floor to floor height. So we're, we're either trying to minimize that sandwich of floor to floor with structure and MEP services, uh, because when you're building super tall buildings, even, even 150 mil on every floor levels, when you're building 100, 120 floors, is a lot of building envelope. So we're always trying to minimize that floor to floor height. So this is really uh, the ideas of exploring AB means active beam system and the VAV system on the right hand side. Again, these are studies with Peter where we try to optimize building systems. Um, it just in terms of how much space they take up in the building and then it would be a discussion with the client what the market will accept and what he wants to own and operate. So lots of studies about facade design and you can start to see these are some of Peter's diagrams in terms of you know, what the, the glass is doing, whether it's double glazed or whether it's triple glazed and just how that impacts performance and design. The last example is really uh, an another competition that we did with Peter. Um, this is part of an overall master plan. Uh, interesting problem for us, it's the last of uh, uh, nine buildings on a site and it was run by the local government and they were going to occupy the top five floors of the building. So this is like a hybrid of an end user that we know is going to move in there and speculative office. So for us that was an interesting kind of problem. So the site actually sits on the corner, a very, very prominent position. This is actually a super tall building, the, this one here which actually one of my colleagues in the Shanghai office is, is doing now, which is under construction. And we had this, we inherited this idea of this boomerang at raised walkway, which was connecting five of the buildings. So for us, it's not just about building systems, it's about how does this building work within the environment that it's located. So we had this curious kind of thing whereby uh, some of the views or the best views were towards me uh, and how do you place a square within another square when it's on the corner to optimize views and aspect and daylight. So we ended up with this idea of the idea of the twisting square which introduced some quite interesting ideas in terms of how we might develop an approach for kind of passive shading systems. So you can see that the building shape and form is actually responding to the sun path directly. And so different solutions inevitably would have to be developed. So in the morning, we've got a low sun angle. Midday, it's quite high. And then in the afternoon, it's dropping again. And we've, we often find when Peter does his calculations, the worst part of the day is not usually midday. It's usually three o'clock in the afternoon when the sun's kind of halfway up in the sky, but it's coming directly in horizontal. And so no horizontal shading or vertical shading works at that point. So that's when we have to sort of develop some alternative approach to maybe have some active systems to mitigate uh, solar gains. We did lots and lots of studies, not only on how the building's affected by solar uh, gains during the day, but what is the daylight quality in that space during the day? How are we affected? Because one of the dilemmas we have is to stop the sun coming into the building, but we want to maximize daylight because we don't want to be relying on artificial light when the blinds are down. So it's always this constant balance of between using energy to stop the sun coming in and then having to use energy because you've stopped the sun coming in and you need artificial light to light the space. So that balance is always part of our design and calculation. So we're trying to optimize it all the time. So uh, Peter's going to talk about, uh, and this is probably a phrase that you've heard of, is energy and use. 
So, because um, it's one thing to actually design the building systems and it's one thing to understand what that costs you over a lifetime of a, of a building, whether that's 20, 25 years. So, this is something Peter drills into us every single time we work in China. There's obviously a baseline code that we have to satisfy and uh, it's really based on the diagram on the left is the breakdown of how energy is typically used in a building. And then what we try to do on all of these is to try and improve the facade performance. Now the facade performance in any building operation usually only really accounts for 15% of the overall energy. So even if you double the performance of the facade, you're only really actually saving 7% of the overall um, energy consumption. So for architects, that's everything because what the building looks like, the curtain wall is what the building looks like. So everything that goes on inside is all hidden. So again, this is another dilemma I have as an architect is how much time and energy do we um, invest in trying to develop uh, curtain walling systems bearing in mind that the energy re reduction on an overall sense is actually only a small component of the, the building energy. So these are all figures from Peter, not me. Uh, so this just starts to compare how our building would react to certain building systems. So um, we're always, as architects, and I think from Peter's perspective and maybe most people in the room, we're always trying to kind of adopt the kind of water-based systems now. We're trying to move away from all air systems because we find from an occupancy point of view and from an energy reduction point of view, water being more of an efficient cooling and heating medium rather than air results in higher performance building and higher comfort for building occupants. So sometimes, especially in China, we don't always win that argument because the market's not really ready for anything other than VAV systems, but uh, every single time we try and try and push the, the radiant systems. I think I'm almost getting to the end. So, again, these are all the things that we have to think about in terms of how we develop what the building is and what it looks like. And we're always, always conscious as architect working with people like Peter about what that energy, um, energy use is. So, I think we're almost at the end. So uh, that's, this is my last slide. Um, I'm sure we'll have questions after Peter's given his presentation. Um, these are just some of the projects that I've been involved in. Um, I've been very, very lucky to work for a number of very good design firms all over the world. Um, and I just enjoy designing tall buildings. So thank you.